Hey everyone, welcome back. We're gonna try to make gas great again today. I haven't seen anybody cover this in recent times, but I'm sure there's some videos hiding out there similar to this topic. Now, this is another idea that came from some friends in the community discord, but it was originally on Nidus. While it does work, I thought, this is pretty plain, there's nothing special, not enough synergy. So let's spice things up a bit. There are two frames I'll be showcasing today. The first, as you can tell, is Harrow. Now let's go over the big parts of the build. Shattering Impact is a mod that strips armor from enemies. Armor is a huge problem in Steel Path because everything is plus 100 levels, and they get the Steel Path health and armor multiplicative bonus multipliers. For unoptimized loadouts, it can be no fun. The main way to get past this is to either bypass the armor with Slash, overwhelming amounts of buffs for raw effective damage types such as Radiation or Corrosive, or fully stripping armor off. The last one is where we're going today. Shattering Impact has limited use because it only works on weapons that have innate impact damage. You do not have to proc the impact status though, but the weapon does have to be capable of actually doing impact. Basically, the damage instance itself has to have impact. This is why lasting status DOTs like Slash, Heat, Electric, Toxin, Gas, etc. cannot strip armor when used by a weapon with this mod. This is also why Redeemer cannot armor strip on shots because it's pure blast. This is also why stuff like Sarpa and Vassalok are so good for armor stripping. Because each pellet has the full effect of the mod. But keep in mind Shattering Impact strips base armor, not scaled armor. Base armor is unique to each enemy and doesn't change no matter their level. Scaled armor is what happens after you apply level and steel path modifiers. This means that no matter their level, normal or steel path, it will always take the same amount of Shattering Impact procs to fully strip armor on one enemy type which is amazing. But because Corrosive Projection reduces scaled armor, this means Shattering Impact and Corrosive Projection do not interact. The amount of CPs or Shattering Impact hits required do not change depending on how many of the others present. Know this, so that the next time someone asks you how much Sarpa or Vastlock shots you need for X amount of CPs, remember that it doesn't matter. It's always the same, but this is where I throw you for a loop. We have this weapon called Argonac, some of you might be aware of this already. This weapon has a mod called Amalgam Argonac Metal Augur. Now I don't care about any of the effects of the mod except the middle one. Damage from daggers reduces armor by 6. This is a huge thing because unlike Shattering Impact, it does not proc from inflicting impact damage. It procs from any damage inflicted by a dagger. And guess what? This includes dots. And you know what dot has an AoE size and persists over time? Gas. This is how we're going to make gas great again. So how about we take a look at the Argonac build I'm going to bring then? Well, that's pretty underwhelming, but this is because I'm bringing it purely as a stat stick. The only useful mods here are Amalgam Serration for the extra sprint speed and Amalgam Argonac Metal Auger for the reasons I went over earlier. Primary Dexterity is pretty useful here since I'm using a melee focused build. This is the only weapon arcane that can help melees by giving them an extra 7.5 seconds combo duration. Now let's look at that melee. You may be wondering why I picked Rack to Dark Dagger instead of Bala. Yes, Bala has more range and better crit versus status distribution, but we don't need more damage. There's a couple of reasons for why I picked Rakta instead, and no, it is not for the Syndicate proc. Rakta is more accessible because it doesn't require the know-how to build a Zaw and balance stats or the annoying Cetus grind. Obviously, none of these apply to me, so let's move on to the next reason. Although a more balanced Bala can have better crit, I'm just using this because Rakta already has high status. Enough that it's similar to the highest Bala can get. Why make a Bala that's barely better status-wise when you could use those parts to make a different Zaw, like an Exodian Contagion setup? Basically, we're looking at a more status-focused build today, as Contagion performs much better DPS as a crit setup. Rakta also has an augment that you could theoretically equip to get free viral procs if you want to, but that is mostly nullified by bringing a primer. Finally, the last and most important reason, and the reason why I chose the frames I did today. Hitting irradiated enemies with Rakta Dagger gives us shields and overshields based on damage dealt. Rakta has innate radiation, but it's low weight on my final build. This is a non-issue because I will be including radiation on my primer, and basically gives us persistent shield gate if we can keep it up. It does not activate if our shields are fully empty, but in this case I'm using the shields given for more ability synergy, rather than a continuous form of invincible shield gate. So, like I said, this is my Rakta build. You may be wondering why I'm using gas instead of electric. If any DOT can armor strip and electric only takes a single mod and actually scales better off mods than gas. Well, 
Like I said, it's more of a status focused build. A huge chunk of her damage comes from armor strip potential. Electric is nice, yes, but the, if there aren't a ton of enemies present, it's crap. More stacks only make it do bigger tick damage. If the enemies die, their electric procs disappear. Gas, on the other hand, persists after enemies die, and more stacks not only increase its damage, but also expands the radius of the cloud itself. So you can end up with a massive overlapping group of clouds to stack the armor stripe ticks from each enemy all onto everybody else in the clump, even if they're dead. Because the clouds persist after death, the longer you attack grouped enemies, the more damage you will do with your DOTs and the more armor you will strip. This is the opposite of electric, where the longer you attack enemies in groups, the more of them will die, which both slows down the amount of dots and armor strip. So the end of the crowd is always harder to kill than the start. Gas continues to get stronger the more you hack away as the clouds continue to stack and proc more of Amalgam Argonac Metal Logger. So let's get back to the build. I have established that gas dots do not scale with elemental mods, therefore we need as much much raw damage as we can get. That's why I'm running Prompt Fever Strike despite it not scaling into the dots, it's still good for the raw hit as you continue to attack. And more importantly, this is why Condition Overload is absolutely mandatory for the build. You need a primer to proc viral, and also give massive amounts of base damage because base damage does scale into gas dots. Prime Smites are essential so that gas dots double dip in their damage, and we really need this since they don't scale with elementals, like I said. Prime Reach increases the range from 1.75 to 4.75, or nearly triple the original. This is extremely important because our main goal is to proc as much gas clouds as possible, hitting more enemies in the crowd at once to proc clouds to strip armor 7 times faster. Because our swings cover up roughly 7 times more area with Prime Reach, it's infinitely more important than slotting another damage check mod in. With the amount of gas clouds produced, the sheer armor strip and DOTs and dot quantity completely offsets the initial damage loss of using a mod for range and is what gives the build infinite scaling. Blood Rush pushes the 12% crit to 64.8, which we will add more to on later still. Oregon Shatter is important to put these crits to use with extra crit damage. Weeping Wounds allows our status to reach 162% at 12x combo. Basically, this is a light attack meat blender setup. I've been talking so much about the primer, so how about we look at that? I'm running a massive gathering setup for my frames today, so I would prefer Epitaph instead of Kuva Nukar due to the sheer amount of enemies sucked in. This does mean you need to fit Prime Sure Footed on your frame somehow though, otherwise Kuva Nukor still does work well enough. Now this epitaph is Radiation Viral, remember how I said Rack to give shields and overshields when hitting irradiated enemies? Yeah, so this is why. Also, Radiation turns friendly fire on in general and acts as a form of cheap CC to stop those enemies from shooting you even when you don't cast Ability CC. This is a full utility epitaph with two Augur mods for the set bonus, but it also gives a tiny bit extra status duration. Three shots is all you really need for any crowd. This build has a 170% status chance and 2.8 multi shot. Every shot produces about 5 status procs, mostly radiation and viral. So 3 shots will give you about 5 rile stacks and radiation each. You'll also get about 3 blast procs from the innate blast, and Epitaph also has force cold procs, so you'll easily get about 8 after 3 shots. That's 320% base damage for Rakta before you account for Rakta also producing gas and the force impact and slash procs from the homing fan stance. Now we're at 560% base damage for Condition Overload. We're doubling up on Dexterity Arcanes today, because slotting it both on Argonac and Epitaph does stack and grants our Rack to Dark Dagger 20 seconds combo duration. This means you technically have the option to run Xenoric for Energizing Dash if you want, instead of Nermon. Our pets today? Panzer Volpophila for consistent Vile procs from Viral Quills. This will round out our Viral better, so we aren't entirely reliant on Epitaph. This will let us cap to 10 Viral a lot more consistently, as the spores will spread very easily when killing grouped up enemies. Synth Deconstruct is meh for Epitaph because it has no magazine, but if you're using Kuva Nukor instead, you will appreciate it for the holster reload passive on the sets. Martyr Symbiosis helps to keep you alive, and Panzer Devolution gives your kitty infinite lives. The rest of the build is pure utility. A melee DOT gas build with Hunter Recovery should keep your cat on full health, unless it gets one shot. Link mods are the standard. You could technically run Link Shield since we'll be abusing shields and overshields, but that's up to you. Primed Animal Instinct for the radar, and fetch. Oh, and for the builds I'm going to show you, make sure you've brought Megas Elevate. This will let you always heal up your frame in a pinch, and can be obtained from Quill Onko on Cetus. Now if you want those orange crits that I advertise at the start, then you could just run an Adarza Kavat instead for Cat's Eye for the crit bonus as well as Tech Enhance to give an extra 20% duration to it. So our first frame up today is Harrow. Hooray! A frame I haven't showcased in forever. Anyways, there is a ton of synergy going on here. 
First, prime share footage for general utility and especially if you're using Epitaph. Now let's take a look at this duration. So for grouping abilities, we have a choice of Larva, Ensnare, or Air Burst. I didn't take Larva because we need duration on Harrow. Being unable to recast Larva without wasting a slot on the frame for Larva Burst when Ensnare is available is a waste. And for Air Burst, it has slightly weird ragdoll physics even after the buffs they gave it last month, so it sucks it into a ball just above the floor instead of inside of it. I would use it for a gun build, but not really so much for a melee DPS setup. So Ensnare is the way to go. Just keep in mind it has slightly less grouping because it can't clip enemies inside of each other due to the lack of ragdoll effects. Also notice that we aren't going for Eclipse or Vora on any of those normal shenanigans. The Gas Dagger is just so strong we don't need it. Duration is the most important stat on this build. We need a ton of it so that our Covenant lasts long enough not only to use but also to set up. It also makes the other abilities last much longer. Basically, you can lock down entire tiles with the East. The extreme amounts of CC on this build limits the potential of taking damage. But this is where combat discipline comes in. Even if the entire tile is locked down and you aren't being shot at, there's still plenty of time for you to cut your way through the crowd in the next 15 seconds, which will self-damage you with combat discipline, which counts into the damage absorbed to fuel your crit buff from Covenant. This self damage also fuels into our Arcane Adventure to proc, which will go off a ton, and due to the high KPS of this setup, this pushes Rakta from 64.8 to 109.8 crit chance. This is a massive DPS increase and guarantees crits for consistency. We can also afford to run a max rank on a discipline to save Forma for the excessive self damage instead of rank 0, because Harrow's 2 gives us lifesteal, and with the range of our dagger with Ensnare, you will have all the lifesteal you ever need. And guess what? His 2 scales off current shields to determine its duration. Normally you get overshields with his one, but we replace that. Instead, we'll be getting capped overshields every single time you swing your Rakta through the crowd. We get 120 seconds duration on its two this way. Harrow's passive lets him get up to 2,400 overshields instead of 1,200 bonus. For this reason, we can safely skip redirection. 120 seconds is more than enough. Range is also somewhat important on this build for the usage of Ensnare, so I built that up with the overextended and stretched to counter narrow-minded. Ensnare has more range than Larva when subsumed, so we don't need to go all in on range, especially we can spam Ensnare all you want because it doesn't have the duration restrictions like Larva. We completely dumped efficiency because our 3 can fuel all the energy we need and and with 254 duration, it also lasts 89 seconds. If you have energy problems to get his 3 casts to start off with, that's why we brought Arcane Energize. The high range on the build also means his 3 durable will actually manage to help your teammates as well since it has 34 meter radius on setup. You also have the option of Energy Pads or Xenric to start your 3 off at the start of the mission. Finally, Strength has several uses. It buffs the fire rate and reload of your weapons. This lets you spam Epitaph or your new core faster to prime enemies better. It also will improve the conversion rate of damage taken into crit chance on your 4. Therefore, even if nothing touches you, but you just kill a bunch of enemies and stack up on combat discipline procs, you will still get a sizable amount of crit from your covenant after the invulnerability period ends. So let's go slap some enemies. First, Corrupted Heavy Gunners. I've already built up my combo and now let's go. You want your 3 up as your priority in missions. This is where Zener can help out as I said for energizing dash and then we ensnare them. If this is your first group of enemies in the mission so far or your rotation is reset, this is where you shoot epitaph 3 or 4 times. Now you cast your 4 and because we aren't using natural talent, look at this. Double tap escape and animation skip that crap. Now this does not work on all abilities though. For example, you cannot skip Necrosis 4 animation with this. We want as much time as possible to kill enemies while the invulnerability period is up, which is why we cast Ensnare and Primer before casting your 4. There we go, 40 kills and we got 19 or 20% flat crit buff on top of that for our 4, or 4 times that for headshots. You can see in the corner that we do get headshots from time to time from this homing fang stance, and as you kill more, the crit bonus will go even higher. So as you can see, it's still viable, even if there's no enemies that hit you, otherwise that will cap you to 50% instantly. Then cast your 2 to finally get that fire rate buff. I'm wasting time here responding which doesn't happen in an actual Steel Path mission because Endless spawns. Now let's try Drakar Manic Bomb Runs and see if they put up a better fight. Same thing, we get our 3 up, cast and snare. I still have my 2 active but my 4 has fallen off. So will Prime, cast 4 again and animation cancel. Now we melee them down and look, they died. Time to respawn. And snare, Prime, melee spam and they're dead. 
And now my invulnerability ended. Now that's another 20% flag crit chance. So you want to see those orange crits from the start? That's just slapping in a Darzaron as well and set a Panzer for Cat's Eye. Now I have 109.8% crit chance with just Avenger. Adarza gives us an extra 60, and Covenant will give you always at least 20% as you saw even if nothing hits you, so long as you keep killing. So now we're above 200% crit, and that's it. Now how about our second frame? All things equal, the entire loadout remains the same, except this time we're taking Hildren. Now let's take a look at this build. So this is another combat discipline build. This one actually needs a rank 0. Honestly, you can reach this with a properly formed adaptation slot and regular intensify instead of umbral. Megas Elevate will still come in handy to heal you up with a quick operator swap so you don't kill yourself with the aura eventually. Like I said, pick this aura arcane up from Quilanko and Cetus. Prime sure footed like I said before too, to block that knockdown say if you're using epitaph or just general utility and safety. Adaptation does not need to be maxed because all that affects is how fast it reaches 90% damage reduction against enemy types. Notice we are going for range this time. Strength is also important to get the value out of armor strip from pillage. This also means we need a dump stat. Hildren doesn't have an easy way to get energy back, or should I say shields, like the ridiculous energy gain from Harrow's Thurible. While she technically has infinite energy in the form of recharging shields, it's still possible to bottom out. So for that reason, we went neutral efficiency. This is also the side effect of dumping our duration, but this is fine. You see, since we built for a range for a helmet subsume, pillage already has a decent starting radius of 18 meters. And because we're pulling enemies to us, we don't need excessive range or pulse radius on that scales with duration either. For this reason, I'm choosing Larva instead of Ensnare. Larva is best option because it has a faster pull than Ensnare with a tighter ball for overlapping hitboxes and gas. It also doesn't have the weird ragdoll physics of Air Burst, and because we're dumping duration, we can actually spam it. The near non-existent duration is fine because the epitaph I'm bringing also gives cold and radiation proxies to CC enemies even after a larva ends, as well as priming. Because we don't have a pulse expansion radius on pillage as duration is tanked, and the enemies we pull in are also hard CC'd by larva and epitaph, I've chosen to not run the holy grail blazing pillage mod. Actually, in fact, that was the mod I chose to drop to fit in adaptation on this build as everything else is important. The higher range is needed because Larva has reduced base range on Helminth, even less than in Snare. It also helps Haven, but we aren't running Blazing Pillage, so this ability isn't as important and doesn't need to be up unless you want to help your teammates and give them improved shield gating, as they do get 3 seconds of invulnerability when their shields break while linked, instead of the standard 1.3. Arcane Avenger once again works to push our rack to Dagger to 109.8 as I said for guaranteed crits, and the second Arcane is up to you. You can take Arcane Strike as shown here to increase the rate of gas procs and armor stripping from swinging your rack to faster, or you can opt for Arcane Velocity instead so you can shoot your epitaph faster just like as if you had Harrow's penance buff active. Hildred's rotation is a lot simpler to run. There isn't a prep like Thurible, but you do want to cast Pillage now and then again to keep your overshields topped up. For the actual DPS setup, you Larva somewhere to pull enemies in. Then you will cast Pillage, optionally, to strip a chunk of their armor. Then you just go to town, mashing E. At some point, you can stop hacking away if they're too tanky and just spam Pillage instead. It's entirely up to you as your gas procs are already maxed out. Technically, your Balefire Charger is also functional on this build since Avenger pushes its crit chance all the way up to 50% and it has massive base damage. So if you do for some reason want to use that, go ahead. So how about we spawn some Drakar Manic Bombards? Well, it's basically the same story. Now, because we can't pull these enemies in with Larva, I'm gonna have to use Xenoric to drag them in instead. Also, they're immune to radiation procs, so Rakdos passive isn't proccing here, but we're just doing this for the damage test. Still an easy kill, the only drawback I can think of is how gas clouds can eat your FPS for breakfast. What's left to show? Well, just some steel path footage of course. Enjoy!
running out of time. Consider extraction. And there you have it, the orange crit gas nuke. It's been brought back and better than ever before. It may not be red crits, but well, thanks again to community discord for the suggestion to cover gas daggers. This is my take on it after original suggestion to try it on Nidus. I hope you like what you saw today and can make the most use out of it. Otherwise, I hope at least it was entertaining. If this is your first time watching, feel free to leave a like or better yet subscribe. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. 79.5% of you are not subscribed. I'm trying my best to get you new information out always as soon as possible. Possible. Like I've done with covering Sisters of Parvels and the Plague Star updates. Stick around if you want to see interesting memes and builds on a nearly daily basis. I'm also preparing to get you the info first once more new war info drops. You don't want to miss out on any of that, do you? That'll be it for this video. Thank you all for watching, and see you all next time.